I'm Adam Riley. Tonight on Greater Boston, the Newton teachers' strike is in the books, but are others on the horizon? They're against the law, and they cost unions hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines, but a group of state lawmakers are pushing to make them legal. I'll talk to one of them ahead. Then several state troopers are facing bribery charges for a years-long commercial license scheme. GBH News State House reporter Katie Lannon joins me to break it down. Eleven school days later, kids in Newton are back in their classrooms after the city's teachers union and school committee passed a deal to end the longest teachers strike the state has seen in decades. Now, the union faces as much as a million dollars in fines for breaking the state law against strikes by public employees. But a group of legislators are pushing to change that with a bill that would legalize striking for public employees. So where does that bill stand? And does all of this signal more teachers' strikes to come? I'm joined by one of the bill's sponsors, State Rep Erica Eiderhoven and Boston Globe columnist Scott Lehigh, who's out with his new novel, Just East of Nowhere. Thank you both for being here. So, uh, Representative, you were on the picket line, right, with the teachers in Newton. Uh, they got some good benefits when this was all finished. I want to just run through some of what they got after striking a 12.6% cost of living increase mm -hmm. over four years, 60 days of parental leave, more social workers in schools, increased wages for classroom aides and substitutes, and it's going to cost the district about $53 million more than their last contract. Mm -hmm. From your vantage point and the vantage point of the people you were on the picket line with, why did they have to strike to get that deal? Well, I think what we're seeing with educators in Newton and educators across the state, that they're needing to stand up to fight for all the needs of their students and their families. And most notably, the, the support for mental health and social workers was a huge one. We've seen that be an incredible need post-pandemic. And ensuring to fight all the inequities in our public school systems. And that includes both ensuring that teachers are paid a competitive wage to ensure that there are no vacancies and that they're filled with the most qualified candidates, and to ensure that paraprofessionals and educator aides are being paid a living wage. And unfortunately, 20-something thousand dollars a year, which is where Newton was at until this contract with negotiation paraprofessionals, with paraprofessionals, right? yeah, is, is, you know, unfortunately very shameful. Um, and unfortunately, there's still other districts that pay as low as 13K or, you know, in the teens. And that's just not a living wage anywhere in the state. Paraprofessionals, which say are people who work in classrooms, helping yeah. the teachers, yeah. right, students who have special needs. Yeah, and oftentimes working with the most vulnerable students in the classroom. Yeah. I, I want to re-ask my question, though, just because I, I want to get your thoughts on why a strike was necessary to yeah. do this, the, the advocacy that you just described. Why couldn't that advocacy be done in a collective bargaining process that resulted in no school days missed yep. and the concessions being, I shouldn't say concessions, the uh, the gains being made by teachers that I just described. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's important to look at the context prior to this. There were 16 months of negotiations for a three-year long contract, right? So what we've seen over and over again, particularly in the districts that have had to use this very last resort extreme measure to go on strike, is that we've seen these sto stonewalling, stalling tactics, um, particularly these bad management practices. Um, notably, right, it includes both not coming to the negotiating table, but also substituting instead of actually negotiating good faith, hiring anti-union law firms and communication consultants to figure, you know, resolve things rather than just sitting down at the negotiating table and figuring it out. And uh, that's something that my legislation really tries to address. And I believe that we would actually see fewer strikes if this legislation was passed. Hold that yeah, thought. I want to get yeah, to your absolutely. bill in just a second. Yeah. But I know I need to get, get uh, yeah. Scott in here, who has a very different take on teachers' strikes and public employee strikes, generally speaking. Scott, when it comes to the Newton strike, do you have a problem with the terms of the settlement that the teachers reached with this, with Newton, or is your problem more with the tactics that they used to get more them? More with the tactics. I, I mean, I, th I think that the, the union here ended up really looking pretty silly. I, oftentimes, and I think this has happened, you notice all the unions that do this, they are MTA unions, Massachusetts Teachers Association unions. They're not um, American Federation of Teachers, the other, the other um, big union in the state. So they, that's the state's divided between the two. And usually the AFT teachers represent the, the cities and um, MTA teachers uh, re tend to represent the, the, the suburbs and often the tonier suburbs. And to, to hear the rhetoric here, honest to God, you would think the teachers were up against Peabody Coal Company or Tesla or some big conglomerate that, would, that, that was uh, just intent on kind of grinding them beneath their boot rather than uh, um, the leaders in a city 
that a liberal city that that cares about education, that pays its teachers in the top 25% of, of teachers statewide has very good benefits. And if you look at the teacher retention, teachers stay in Newton because they like to teach there. Uh, the rhetoric to my mind just got absurd. I mean, uh, the, the union leader saying, I am so mad at these city leaders. They don't realize the harm that they're doing. And on the picket line, they were talking about, we'd be out here even if a volcano was erupting. They just looked silly to my mind. and and going out on pub crawls at night. And then finally, when the judge did what he should have done, I think all along, because strikes are illegal by public employees in Massachusetts. And, and he said, okay, you are going to face a series of accelerating fines if, you, if you're gonna keep doing this. They um, you know, decided it was time to, to settle. And I think that should have, now they, they've cost their kids 11 days. They've cost them their February vacation. And they'll go into the summer because of this. They've disrupted the community, the people who I think genuinely do care about them and who pay them well. And to act as though this is your, your again, your, your campaigning here against a, a rapacious coal mine or something, it's just dumb. Erica, I want to get your take mm -hmm. on Scott's assessment of the, the tactics and the tenor mm -hmm. uh, among the strikers. He says... They're not going against a rapacious, fundamentally exploitative private company, but against a municipality that uh, represents people of, of good intent who value education. What would your response be? Well, I think there's a, a few things here. One is that actually the vast majority of contract negotiations settle before getting into a strike, right, regardless of which federation they're part of. Um, what we have seen, and also I will say that the demands that we've seen from these locals are pretty consistent. They ask for, you know, social workers and mental health supports, as well as a a, you know, living wage for paraprofessionals and, and a competitive wage for educators. And again, I think $20,000 is really, really abysmally low. Um, so those demands have been very consistent among educators, parents, students, and the community. What's different is the management practices that we see and the, the negotiation practices that we've seen emerge from the districts that don't come to the settlement. And I think, you know, like we, I said earlier, 60 no, months right, yeah. is, you know, is quite a long time for, for figuring out a contract. Um, ultimately, they settled on what we've seen be settled across the state, right? And so I think that's where the, the issue is coming with the negotiation tactics. And even the judge himself said, you know, he was concerned and expressed concern that these coercive fines don't do anything to ensure that there is a fair uh, and effective uh, collective bargaining process taking place. I chatted briefly with both of you before the show. Yeah. Uh, Scott, hold your thought. I, I'll give you a chance to, to hop back in here. But I do want to give yeah. you a chance first, Erica, to talk about your legislation. Yes. Because you said that you think the bill that you filed would actually make these strikes less likely yes. by legalizing them. Why would that be the outcome, do you think? Well, so my bill essentially says that you need to do six months of good faith uh, negotiations, and then it would be lawful to go on strike. And so six months caps it so that there isn't some power dynamic, or I should say abuse of power, to say we're going to now send the courts and the fines after you, but actually forces for six months for this negotiation to take place without the stalling, without the, you know, without the pushing it off and you know having hiring law firms and consulting to get deal it with done the and issue. don't get it done. Exactly, basically. like get to the table, like we see with any fair labor negotiating practices, right? So that's something that I think would ensure that we don't get to this impasse, which again is the exception, not the rule, and that most districts are able to get to these agreements and they're very consistent across the board. Scott, if you remember what you were going to say before, I'm happy to have you make that point. And if you don't remember what you were going to say before, I'd love to get your well, thoughts Well, yeah, on. what I was going to say is I, I think a lot of these benefits, frankly, they had, they had secured before they even went out. Um, so, I, I, I mean, the union, a union will never say, wow, we got our clock clean in that strike. They just don't do it. But I, I think what they actually won here was pretty minimal. And with decent negotiators, they, they should have been able to find a way to, to get that done at the table. They walked away from mediation. They, I mean, it is true, they their their contract had expired, but they were, were of course, you know, working under the uh, the tenants of, of the last contract. It's not as though they didn't have protections to this or that. That's the way it always works. And, and so I, I think it, it, the MTA, for them, the strike is the goal. This is what, since the MTA lurched left with Barbara Mataloni and then with Mary Najami and now with uh, with um, Max Page, who's kind of a gently born uh, university socialist, who who I think believes he's John L. Lewis or Walter Ruther or some great you know labor leader taking on on huge greedy enterprises. Uh, he's wanted to he's wanted unions to strike, and they, you can watch these unions 
Um, there, as I say, they're all MTA affiliates that have gone out. And uh, in the last, what, three years, we they, they all have been. And you watch the MTA in the Haverhill thing. The, the judge fined the MTA for encouraging the strike. I think they paid a $50,000 fine. And in uh, the Woburn thing, a uh, uh, strike, the judge ordered the MTA to stop encouraging the strike. So this is a tactic. Well, let me from, ask... Yeah. Well, let me ask you if you if you uh, if you believe, and I'm not endorsing or rejecting this proposition, yeah. but that the strike is the point for some union leaders. Do you buy the idea, as a long-term student of state government, local government, do you buy the idea that legislation like Rep. Eiderhoven's and her colleagues, by legalizing strikes after a six-month good faith bargaining period, could actually reduce the number of strikes? Because no, it sounds no, like I, I don't think it'll work. Okay, out. why not? Here's the problem, and, and I'm a supporter of unions in the private sector, where I think they are, are a, a very important counterbalance to corporate power. Um, but you have a very different political dynamic and, and kind of political economy in the, in the public sector. Uh, and what we've done in, with teachers and with public employees in general, we have granted them a monopoly on the provision of certain services. You want to, um, they have a monopoly on the provision of education. You can't both have a monopoly on a service and the right to strike because it means that power is disproportionate. You have given the union an ability to disrupt um, civic life uh, as they press their demands. And they, I mean, you always talk about the rhetoric is always, well, we're doing this for the children. And you hear Max the talk, Max Page talks about it. Teachers hate to be ripped away from the classrooms, but unions, I mean, let's be honest about it. Unions generally represent, it's completely appropriate. It's their role. They recommend, they uh, represent the economic interests of their employees. And that's pretty much what this was about. If you say to the union, you can go out and strike legally with no consequence and disrupt um, civic life and you know dis, dis, uh, inconvenience parents and families indefinitely until you get your way, you will have drastically changed the balance of power there and, graduate, and, and granted to people who have a monopoly disproportionate bargaining power. It's just, it's just Frank, hey, I, with apologies to, to Erica, it's just it's bad policy that doesn't make sense in the in the political ecology of the uh, of the situation. Uh, I will say, you know, monopoly implies that there's one single owner. And what we've seen over and over again with these strikes is that you have 98 percent of the vote of all of the members, right? You have the vast support. And I think I'll say, speaking for as a legislator myself, it's very challenging to get 98 percent of any group of people to agree to something. So what I think is underlying those votes and these democratic institutions that make up unions is not about some single actor or owner, but it's about the deep injustices and inequities in our system that leads us to get to this point of saying we are not getting the results that we need to ensure that our public schools are thriving, that our students are being well resourced and supported, and that educators are put in a corner to have to make more with less. And so that, Eric, you know, that's, what, I think that's largely what's driving these strikes and not sort of this one owner narrative around monopolization. Can, of, I, can I just make this point sector. though on a monopoly? Let, let's, say, let's say you're a labor leader at Ford and you go out and you're on strike and, and um, fine. If there if there aren't Ford vehicles for people to buy, they can go buy Chevys or Toyotas or other things. If you are a teacher, if you're a teacher's union, and it might be a, let's say half the teachers did not want to strike or a third of the teachers did not want to strike. Once you strike, they all have to go out. And if you're a parent, because the union has a monopoly in the provision of public education in Newton or in Woburn or in Melrose or in Brookline, any of the other places that have gone out on strike, there's not an option for a parent to say, well, okay, we're not satisfied with this product. We can go have our kids educated somewhere else. It, it just, there isn't that. So it is a monopoly, even though the vote might not be um, a, you know, a monopoly vote. Eric, I wanna get your take on the prospects of your legislation and the companion legislation filed in the Senate on Beacon Hill. My sense from afar is that there's some skepticism mm -hmm. and that it's not a slam dunk, even though I think of the legislature as usually being sympathetic to organized yes. labor. Am I right about that? I would say that with any legislation on Beacon Hill to become a law requires a great deal of political will and a great deal of education on these complex issues. I think that what's happened in Newton and across all of these cities and towns across the state around this requirement and this need uh, for there to be good faith bargaining and good faith negotiations so that we don't ever have to resort to these last you know, measure resort 
sorts. And like I'll say, educators, no, no one wants to be out of the classroom. Um, so I think that the dire need for that, that the current status quo isn't working, is becoming clearer and clearer uh, within. And we've never seen more support than we have now for this legislation. Uh, I want to uh, roll, uh, just hold this off for one second, Scott, because we're about to wrap up, but I want to get you and maybe Rep Eiderhoven to weigh in on this. Let's take a look at what uh, the MTA said after the agreement was struck, suggesting that there were going to be more strikes to come. We taught every other district in this state what will happen if they try to balance their budgets on the backs of our students and educators. That's my mistake. That's the NTA, the Newton Teachers Association. There have been an increasing number of these strikes and uh, increasing disruption from these strikes in recent years, from you know one day in Dedham in October 2019, one day in Brookline in May 2022. Then we've got four days in Haverhill, five days in Woburn, three days in Andover, and now 11 days in Newton. Scott Lehigh, do you expect that this Newton strike is going to pave the way for more actions along these lines in the near future? No, I don't. I think that, that um, again, I, I think on, on Beacon Hill, the, the, the word has already come down pretty clearly that this legislation is not going anywhere. And I think the strike will only reinforce that sense that it isn't. And I think that what, what we've learned here is the judge needs to do what judges usually do. So start with and keep escalating fines as, as a union. That was the mistake that was made here. And, and if judges stick to the pattern of, of doubling or tripling fines as the strike goes on, I don't think you're gonna see longer strikes. And I, I think this, when people really analyze this and see that the Newton teachers didn't get that very much, really get much for it, I think they're gonna say, huh, this was kind of dumb. Last question to you, Erica. If this, does, if this trend does not in fact build support for your legislation as you hope it will, mm -hmm. Do you then anticipate more strikes along these lines in the future? I think so long that we are underfunding schools and forcing educators and students to have to do more with less, we're going to see a continuation of this impasse and these demands to continue across districts. Uh, my hope is that we're going to keep seeing more and more of these contracts with fair pay, right, living wages, as well as full, full funding of mental health support, paid family medical leave, all of that be included in more contracts because we can see that there are these inequities emerging across the entire public school system. System, and I hope that that will ensure we have the thriving public schools that everyone deserves. All right, on that note, State Rep Erica Eiderhoven, Scott Lehigh of the Boston Globe, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, four current and former state troopers have been charged in a years-long bribery scheme. Prosecutors say they accepted bribes in exchange for passing marks on commercial driver's license tests in just the latest in a long string of corruption scandals surrounding the Massachusetts State Police. GBH News State House reporter Katie Lannon joins me now with more. So, Katie, as I just mentioned, there has been a lot of dysfunction surrounding the State Police in recent mm -hmm. years. It can kind of all blur together. Can you give a recap of this latest scandal for people who need one like, say, me? Sure. So this, uh, according to the, the federal indictment that came down last week, this involved troopers who were assigned to the commercial driver's license unit, and they were uh, text messages amongst themselves show that they would describe giving a certain applicant there for a skills test, uh, a golden handshake or a golden treatment. And that was kind of their internal code word for passing someone either without giving them the whole test or in mm -hmm. some cases, the test at all. Doesn't seem like a really good internal code word, I gotta say. That's just an <laughs> aside. It's rather suggestive. There were the, the text messages, if you read them, there's a lot of emoji usage as well. So it definitely uh, reminded me to think about what I'm texting and whether or not it's gonna end up in a court it's document a someday. But in this case, they were allegedly receiving uh, the one trooper involved in this was alleged to have received a new snowblower, a new driveway, uh, a mailbox at his house, and there were also um, cases of bottled water, hmm. coffee, iced teas. There was a, a bottled water company who was um, one of the employees there was among the people who were indicted in this yeah. as well because he was, I guess, according to authorities, arranging these kind of gifts to them in exchange for, um, you know, a, a golden pathway for drivers affiliated with the company. You know, it's a weird combination of stuff because you talk about, I mean, I guess a new driveway is, is valuable. I'm not sure how valuable bottled water is, but some low stakes gains uh, and massive risk undertaken with, based on those text messages, uh, what sounds like a sense of impunity, just you know, like they didn't need to worry about this. At least that's my quick read on it. What's the response been 
from politicians at the state house who are capable of exercising oversight authority over the state police. Yeah, I, I will say from the jump, you haven't seen a, a lot of kind of clamoring within the legislature for some sort of crackdown or reforms at the state police. And I think part of that is, I mean, this is clearly you know, accepting bribery, accepting bribes is something that's already against the law. Yeah. And the state police has come out with a list of things they did to kind of respond to this. They audited the commercial driver's license, the CDL unit. They've put in some new training, some modernized record keeping. They're doing things like having uh, supervisors drop in for unannounced visits more frequently. So they came right out front and said, here are some things we're doing to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Mm -hmm. So they, they seem to be the most um, active in that front is internally within the department. Well, am I right that this is connected to an investigation that started under Governor Healy when she was Attorney General Healy? That's right. It at least started while she was at the Attorney General's office. I don't know if it was federal authorities investigating at that point or if it was within the AG's office to start. But she, she did point to that. She said she knew about it because of that. Mm. And that she was pleased to see these indictments handed down because you know accountability and transparency are, are paramount. Uh, she's in something of a tricky position, right? Because she travels with a state police detail. Right? Yeah, she does. And, you know, the when she was attorney general, there are troopers assigned to the attorney general's office as well. So she's certainly someone who would closely interact with state police. And she's also uh, going to soon be at some point naming the next head of the state police, which has been uh, operating under an interim colonel for over a year or about a year now. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's really important. And I think I was about to forget it. Why has there been an interim colonel operating under the state police or, uh, pardon me, running the state police? Yeah, that was, there was a, there have been, you know, during this period of turmoil, there's been several kind of leadership changes at the state police. The, the last um, superintendent stepped down, retired about a year ago, um, capping off the, the end of his career, and Healy put in a, an interim head while conducting a, a broader search. And she's going to be able to hire from outside the state police itself, right, due to some of the past That's right. scandals that... Yeah. That was a law, I think, if I remember right, that was changed under Governor Baker? Yep, this was a, the big 2020 police reform package, which came at a time where really throughout the country people were, were looking at laws around policing and what reforms might be needed there. And the law here in Massachusetts did include several changes at the state police within that department itself. One of those is allowing the department to, the head of the department to come not just from within the ranks of the state police, but they can be hired from other agencies as well, as long as they meet certain qualifications. It's not just anyone can come in. But that was a change that former Governor Baker had really pushed for um, in the wake of uh, an overtime fraud scandal where, where troopers right. were collecting pay for, for shifts they didn't work or didn't work in their entirety. Okay, so we've got the commercial license scandal, the overtime scandal. Are there any other scandals before we wrap up that people should be bearing in mind as this all plays out? Yeah, it depends probably on what you count as a scandal. The, the overtime fraud uh, situation was probably the biggest with dozens of troopers implicated. There was an instance where uh, an arrest report was rewritten to uh, cover up some comments from a judge's daughter during while she was being arrested. That was and a bizarre story. That yeah. was, and that had a lot of different uh, tentacles going out beyond it. And there was a, an instance where a former head of the union, of the state police union, was charged with accepting kickbacks and um, misusing union funds. I should say the state police union, in this case, in the CDL scandal, it's outright with a statement expressing disappointment and saying they want to let the judicial process play out and respect everyone's due process rights, but that, you know, that, that that's not what they expect to see from troopers. That is good to hear. Katie Lannon, thank you for breaking down this complicated stuff. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. That's it for tonight, but do come back tomorrow. GBH News transportation reporter Bob C. will join me to answer your questions about the tea. And then local author Celeste Ng discusses her work in the new collaborative novel, 14 Days, co-written by Margaret Atwood, John Grisham, Dave Eggers, R. L. Stein, and more than 30 other authors. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching, and good night.
Hey folks, I can be Herwick III here from GBH's Curiosity Desk, where you ask questions and I find answers. Today, we answer a question about the rules of the road in Massachusetts that came to us from Watertown's Mary Ann Merrigan. Drivers here in Massachusetts are actually pretty lucky that they can turn right on red at any intersection. It's a relatively recent phenomenon, and it came to pass because, of all things, unrest in the Middle East in the 1970s. Bet you didn't see that coming. The 1973 oil crisis pushed gas prices sky high here in the US. So Congress passed sweeping legislation that required states to come up with a plan to reduce gas consumption. Now they offered big money to the states to help them get those plans off the ground. But in order to get those dollars, there was a catch states had to have. A traffic law or regulation which, to the maximum extent practicable, consistent with safety, permits the operator of a motor vehicle to turn such vehicle right at a red stoplight after stopping. The thinking was that allowing right turns on red would mean less idling and therefore less gas consumption. And hey, as a bonus, it might also reduce emissions. Some states already allowed a right turn on red. Congress wanted every state to allow it. And the very last state to comply, you guessed it, Massachusetts. And it appears we did so grudgingly. When right turns on red became legal here in 1980, some 90% of the state's traffic signals were outfitted with a no turn on red sign. Then and now, officials in each city and town decide which intersections in their communities should get a no turn on red sign. Here in Watertown, one of those deciding officials is Steve Magoon. He explained to me that there are three reasons he might choose to restrict a right-hand turn on red. The flow of traffic and the timing of nearby traffic lights. If people made a right turn on red, but then had to stop very shortly after that, it could back up into the intersection. Obstructions, something like a building, might prevent a driver from seeing oncoming traffic. The most common reason? Protecting pedestrians. If you allow someone to turn right on red, and that person's looking for vehicles coming to their left, they're not looking for pedestrians on their right. So, there you have it. Oh, and a quick note of irony before we go. It turns out that allowing that right turn on red doesn't really do that much to reduce emissions. In fact, today, a lot of environmentalists prefer to restrict the right turn on red because it protects pedestrians. Yes, better way to reduce emissions? Don't get in the car in the first place. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and most importantly, let me know what you are curious about because, hey, I might just look into it for you. I'm Edgar B. Harwick III. Stay curious out there. Next time 